I love visiting my local state parks, as I'm sure all of you do. One of my dream jobs has always been being a park ranger or just being a volunteer at one of these state parks. I love hearing stories from them, especially ones that give you a good scare. These subscribers share their creepiest experiences while visiting state parks and or working in state parks. So if you're a fan of park rangers and all that they see, this one's for you. If you have a creepy story that you'd like to share, Send it in to the email or the website that you can find in the description down below. Let's get into these tales of terror. I worked for a state forest service in the tri-state area several years ago in a field location that was 250 year old farmhouse. The basement was dug and compacted earth. There were large fireplaces in several rooms. A few Stephen had pot hooks in them for heating water and cooking. There was one bathroom that had been installed in the 1940s. Prior to that, there had been none. The floorboards were wide slats of pine, and you could see the hand-forged nails. In some of the areas, they were far enough apart that you could shine a flashlight down through the crack to see the basement floor. Mice and camel crickets were common. They were just a fact of life that we lived with. As was the ancient oil furnace we had in the basement that broke, frequently. In the winter, another odd fact was that the dug earth basement in the farthest and darkest corner, there was a dark room for developing film. I have never even ventured into that room, because it bothered me. I'm going to recall as many of the events as I can in that loose timeline, because it's been eight years since I worked there, so my timeline might not be exact. I always felt watched there. It was a constant feeling that remained until I got into my car to leave at night. There were often strange smells. Sometimes like rose water and oranges that have warm associations, but sometimes like rotten garbage, even when no trash was present. There was a kitchen that had been slightly modernized on at least two occasions. All of the cabinet doors would be shut in the morning, and then as I was upstairs working in the office, I would hear them all open, come back downstairs, and find them all wide open seemingly by themselves. The moment you walked in the door in the morning, it was as if you felt eyes turning on to you. Our one secretary dealt with this by very loudly announcing, good morning, to the existing inhabitants. And she said she didn't necessarily feel threatened, but if she started hearing too many noises upstairs while she was alone, she would loudly say, y'all know I don't want to be hearing this. I don't mess with you, so come on, don't mess with me. And she said on some occasions it would stop, but not always. The first time I remember seeing something physically, I usually hear and see images mentally, not with my physical eye. It was about, I don't remember exactly the day, but we had a meeting going on downstairs, and I ventured upstairs to fetch a chapstick out of my bag. My back was to the main hallway, and all of a sudden I heard footsteps to the side of me. I turned and saw two shadowy people, one shorter than the other flash down the hallway into the back office, making footsteps the whole way. On another occasion concerning footsteps, our secretary and I were in the office on a winter morning, just the two of us, and the heat was broken yet again. We sat in the same room downstairs trying to stay warm with a space heater. We couldn't use the fireplaces, they were shut down. We were laughing and talking and all of a sudden we heard a very loud boot clomping steps run from the downstairs foyer to the upstairs and across the hallway, upstairs, directly over our heads to the opposite side of the house. We looked at each other and paused, but at that point we had been used to these kind of shenanigans and felt to. If we let it bother us, it wasn't going to be the best scenario, so we tried to be strong. 
We lost two cleaning people, though. In the evening, after the few of us had gone home, we never had more than six people in the office. We had a cleaning service that came in to vacuum and try to help us with the pest issue by assuring the trash was taken out, and etc. Each night, the cleaning man was to fill out a journal of what was left on my boss's cabinet to tell us what he did. After he had been there a while, he told us in the journal that he had heard his name being called while he was using the vacuum. This happened multiple times. He would turn the vacuum off and it was silent. Finally, I guess he was brave, he said he knocked on the wall and nothing happened at first. Then he knocked and there was a response with two knocks back and he quit after that. My boss had a bad habit of working later in the house after dusk and I would sometimes work with her, but we would never stay past 6.30 or so. It just wasn't a good idea. It was though that the house had a time and we didn't want to intrude on that, like a mutual respect. I know that sounds strange. Before she started putting a cap on for evening hours one night, she was working alone at her desk, facing out into the hallway, when she saw a very tall shadow person pass by the door frame. Slowly, not running like the ones I saw. She said it had to be seven feet tall. It scared her so badly. On another occasion, she was working late, and a giant blue orb about the size of a soccer ball with electrical looking energy coming off of it went down the same hallway, past her door, and crashed into a metal file cabinet we had at the end of the hallway. On yet another occasion, this one was in the afternoon, she was working on a project in our large meeting room, which had likely been a dining room at some point. She was engrossed in what she was doing and oblivious to her surroundings when she looked up and locked eyes with a dark haired man who looked to be in his mid 40s in 19th century dress with gray eyes. She said he looked as surprised that she saw him as she was to see him, and she saw daylight pass through him. He turned to go toward the main stairwell and disappeared. She yelled out, understandably startled, and the secretary and I came running in to see what was wrong. None of us saw him again, though we did give him a name based on what we knew of the house's history. In retrospect, I'm not sure if the name was correct, but we tried to be respectful. In that same room I was simply passing through one afternoon, when I mentally heard a woman's voice say, with great agitation, This is my house! A tired old trope, I know, but there is validity to it when considered in the context that when a canal was being dug in the 1830s near the property, the state was purchasing tracts of land from residents in order to make room for the canal. Later in the 1960s, the state began purchasing large tracts of land in order to preserve them as state parks. One lot being where this house is located. I began leaving a recorder running overnight in different areas of the house, and there were two rooms where I recorded the most. One was in the oldest section of the house, that was once a family room, and the other were the servants' bedrooms upstairs, one which was my office. I should note that this house is located in a very rural area. There is a canal nearby that is now used for only recreational kayaking and fishing and a series of hiking and horse trails but no city sounds or noise interference from neighbors. When I left the recorder in the downstairs family room, on multiple occasions, I would play the recorder back next day and capture beautiful piano music. It sounded faint, but clearly audible. Classical music. We also experienced a scent of fresh pine in this room for no apparent reason, over and over again. The other, far less happy sounds were that of a gruff man's voice and the sound of at least two children crying. I could never make out what the man was saying, and he would be taking a guess as to say what the children were saying. But it always sounded like, I want my mommy. This is the most troubling memory I have of the house. No one likes to think that children suffered. I began going to the local hall of records for the township and doing some research. I was looking up information on the deeds and wills associated with the various individuals who had owned the house through the generations. Most were handwritten and spoke of chain as length of measure and stone markers or rocks marking where the land boundaries were. I found out the names through the most recent family who lived in the house up until 1967, 
who by then was renting it from the state. One particular family had been on the property for nearly 100 years and had a chance of finding a living relative. And I did, and contacted her via email to ask if she would like to visit the house, and she did. She was in her late 80s, 88 I believe at the time. But as a cousin of the family who was still living in the house in the 1930s, she visited frequently as a child. Her mind was clear, and I asked her if the family room is where they would set up the Christmas tree. She said yes. She knew that I had been doing some research on the house, and I asked her if her uncle, who lived with the family but was unmarried and died in 1950 or so, played the piano, and she said yes, that he played beautifully. She was a child and young teen there in the 1930s. I didn't want to trouble or scare her with the details of what had been going on in the house. I just treated it like it was a nostalgic event for her. This obviously doesn't explain everything, because there were so many events that happened in that house, including apparitions in clothing from different time periods, but it explained and verified at least two small pieces of the puzzle. We continued to have experiences there, as well as our contractors, such as two young men we hired. They were to repair a flashing on the roof, and they continuously blamed each other for tools disappearing and reappearing in strange unrelated places. We had to do our own cleaning because we couldn't retain a cleaning person. On yet another occasion we had a visitor use the bathroom where there was a slatted door closet facing the toilet. As she did her business, the closet began to shake violently and the doorknob rattled violently as though someone were trying to escape from inside the closet. She was horribly scared and she jumped off the toilet and pulled her pants up without even using the toilet paper. It was often mischievous, odd behavior. A few years later we lost funding and I had to move to a different site. But, I still see the house when I'm doing extensive bike rides in the area on the Canal Town Path. The house has a field location also lost its funding, so it's been vacant for some years now. There is an old cemetery located in the Windsor State Forest in Massachusetts called Winnedigo. Back in the 40s, it started as a summer camp for kids to hike, play, socialize, and do stuff while their parents were working for the summer break. It could have been up to two dozen kids there per summer. The legend goes that there was an old lady as a counselor there who one day snapped and went crazy. She hung three girls in the barn and drowned the other three in a hot tub. She then killed herself. Let me tell you a quick picture. As you pull into this camp, a small house built in the late 1700s is on the left. After the house is a small shed. A medium sized barn is located across the driveway from the house and right next to the barn is a small cemetery with small unmarked gravestones. It is said that the three girls that haunt the house and three haunt the barn, while the old lady haunts the basement of the house. Inside the house, people have reported hearing laughter and getting small tugs on their clothing, and even seeing shadows popping out around corners. The basement is a different story. In the basement, the old woman's spirit tells you to leave, tries to scare you by moving things around, and people have even reported getting scratched by her. The girl's spirits in the barn, however, are a different story. In the barn, you can hear crying noises and even faint screams. Some have reported hearing them even outside the house. The cemetery is outside. It's like a jackpot of spirit orbs if you're filming or taking pictures. And though it's silent out there, many have reported seeing apparitions and shadows in the cemetery. I myself have been to the cemetery before a few times. Mind you, each time I was there I was completely sober. The first time I went with a few friends we all had flashlights. We stepped out of the car and before we could even turn them on, I stopped everyone and told them to stand still. It was dead silent. Nothing. No bugs, no birds, no noise from houses around. It was eerily quiet. Unsettingly quiet. That made me nervous. We walked towards the house and shined a flashlight in the window. We saw a head move out of the window as soon as we did it. 
The girls with us freaked, but we convinced them to keep moving. We explored the main floor of the house, but we didn't hear anything really. So we went over to the barn. One of the girls, all of a sudden, was overcome with sadness and dropped right to her knees, crying uncontrollably. That freaked the rest of us out, so we picked her up and put her in the car and left fast. Keep in mind, we didn't really hear much of anything. We may have seen an apparition in the window, but that was about it. But the presence up there... I can't explain it. It just feels wrong. Like you're being watched and followed. I'm man enough to admit I'm too scared to return there. This story starts with a group of my friends and myself going backpacking in Yellow River State Park. Six of us were backpacking through the hills during late fall. So there was a lot of dead sticks and leaves all around, yet not very many other backpackers until we came across of a couple of guys heading the opposite way. As we came close to them, they stopped and told us that we shouldn't go down into the valley, as they were there for the last two nights. We asked why not, and they said that they heard people talking near their tent in the middle of the night, even though they were the only ones there. My friends and I shrugged it off, because we ourselves have drunkenly wandered around at night exploring and stargazing. We continued down into the valley and set up our tents. There was two of us in each tent. Three of us brought firearms, just because we were kinda paranoid. We would rather have them and not need them instead of not having them and needing them due to previous experiences. We could all set up and break out our liquor and cards and play a few games in front of the fire before we decide to call it a night. One of our friends passed out in front of the fire and didn't wake up when we tried to move him so we decided we would just let him make his own way to the tent when he was ready and ended up going to bed without him. All of a sudden. We are woken up in the middle of night of a semi-drunk slumber to our friend screaming at the top of his lungs, high-pitched and everything. We, we jumped out of our tents to find out what, why our friend was yelling. Who the hell was that? We had no clue what he was talking about until we saw his face. Now you know when your friend is the first person to pass out at a party you doodle all over his face with Sharpie? Well apparently, some stranger was doing the same thing with charred wood and ashes. The problem was that he had an upside down cross on his forehead and a pentagram on his shirt. I'm not religious at all, but I was kind of freaked out. We ended up going back into the tents, but I don't think any of us got much sleep. Then at about 3.30 AM, we started to hear rustling in the woods around us. It seemed to be everywhere though. Then we heard a voice say, Give him to us. Now I was freaked out and loaded around into my pistol, but my friend seemed to jump the gun, yes, same trigger happy friend, and fired around from his 22 into the air, through his tent. I then hear people running away from what seemed to be all around us. Needless to say, at first light, we packed up and got the hell out of there. We contacted the county sheriff's office and told them what happened but they simply told us that there really wasn't much we could do besides report it. My fiance and I postponed our wedding in 1990. We were getting stressed and needed a vacation. We lived on the big island in Hawaii, so naturally we went to the mainland. We did not have much money, so we rented a car, bought a tent, and decided to try to visit and camp in as many state slash national parks in the western US as we could. We were driving in the middle of nowhere on our way to Yellowstone. It was a desert-like area we were driving through, and it was the end of September, it was very hot. We saw an old building far from the road and decided to take a break to explore it. As we approached the building, we could hear flies and the smell of something bad. We opened the door and it was like a big farm building. The walls and metal roof were splattered in blood. 
everywhere we looked were body parks of elk. I am from the islands, but my fiancé was from Northern California and familiar with wildlife. He said they were elk bodies. There must have been at least 50 or more of them in there. It was so strange. They looked like they were torn apart. Pieces of meat were flung and hung all over inside the building. I freaked out and started to cry. The smell and sights were overwhelming. My fiancé said he couldn't understand it, because it was not like they were being processed or collected for anything. All the meat or horns or everything else was just in there, strewn apart. And he said it looked like they were torn apart, not cut with a knife. I had to go. I felt like I was in shock. My fiancé refused to let me call the police. He said he did not want to get involved. He said it must be the work of crazy poachers. A few miles later, we entered Yellowstone National Park, where as usual, we chose an out-of-the-way campsite. We were on high alert as we had been listening to a news story on the radio about a female hiker camping in a remote area of the park alone. Apparently, she was torn apart by a grizzly bear. There were few details about the attack, and I'm sure I'm unable to find any written reports of it anywhere online. Because we heard the news report on the radio for several days before getting to the park, I find it odd that I can't find much on it. We had a campsite with a bathroom nearby and a barbecue. There were very few people in the park and no one camping near us. There were signs everywhere warning people that they should be careful with food storage because of the bears. We had a couple beers and went to sleep in the tent. I often got hungry after dinner and decided to take a bag of pears into the tent thinking that if I put it under my pillow, that no animals could smell it there. Remember, I'm from Hawaii, and we do not have wild animals here. There are no bears, skunks, possums, squirrel, chipmunk, armadillo, wolverines, elk, lions, or snakes. We do have deer and boar in the mountains, but they were introduced by European hunters like a hundred years ago or so. I fell asleep, pears snugly under my pillow. I was awakened by an immense weight on my upper right side of my chest. My entire right arm and right side of my torso was like felt like it was stuck. My first thought was bear. There's a bear on top of me wanting my pears. But as the seconds developed into minutes and the minutes turned into hours, this immersive weight never once moved, nor did it shift or twitch or even make a single sound. In the first second, I decided not to move or make any noise, and definitely not awaken my boyfriend, who was soundly asleep to my left. I felt myself beginning to panic, thinking that it had to be a bear attracted to my pears or something. But as time dragged on, I realized if this were a wild animal, it was literally on top of me inches from the fruit, it would have pawed or done something to get inside the tent, or at least shifted, moved, or snorted, or breathed as living things do. But to me, I felt like a car was parked on the upper right half of my body, the way it was so heavy and unmoving. What the weirdest aspects besides it being a massive, unmoving, totally science something was that it was warm. This flurry of thoughts and confusion literally dragged on for hours. I became so terrified and overwhelmed. I knew whatever was sitting or standing or laying or parked on me could not have been of this world. Once, after all the hours of trying not to breathe heavily, panic, or even twitch a muscle, I passed out cold from sheer terror. My mind and body just shut down. I totally understand now, when people see a cryptid or a monster, why they faint or lose bowel control. The big difference with me was I could not see it, I could only feel it. And thinking it was a grizzly bear, that that could cause its razor sharp teeth and claws to easily get into the tent, which made it so more confusing. When I woke up the next day, my fiance was already up. I told him what happened, and I was completely freaked out. I checked the tent for any marks or signs of something on the fabric, but there was nothing. There was also no suspicious paw prints or footprints around the tent campsite. Instead of listening to my story, my fiance stopped me at the part about the pears under the pillow and scolded me for quite a while. I was totally still freaked out and wanted to leave. My right arm and the right side of my body were aching. That was not a dream, nor was it sleep paralysis. I have never been that terrified in all of my life, 
never before since that have happened. I told this story to an experienced Sasquatch researcher and he said these types of tent antics are pretty common with juvenile Sasquatch. He said many researchers and witnesses believe that Sasquatch can actually see through the tent fabric somehow and enjoy harassing campers. He calls campers with intense sack lunches. He described how campers tell of being in their zipped up tent and then being picked up and carried several feet away. Other witnesses describe hearing their tent zipper unzip and a hairy hand reach in to touch them. I think what convinced me that this was a Sasquatch reclining on my tent was that what the research explained about Sasquatch abilities, they are able to remain unmoving, even without a twitch or spasm for literally hours at a time. He pointed out how in nature they use this ability to camouflage themselves so effectively. Last Thursday night, me and my fiance were driving around looking for something to do, around 11pm. Our friend Sierra called us and asked if we wanted to meet her and her new boyfriend at a diner in town. We got there and had some pies and decided we should do something. None of us had to work Friday, so we were going to hit the bars. Me and my fiance went to grab another friend of ours who wanted to come. After we got him, we all met back up at the 7-Eleven. It turned out that all the bars were empty, so we were brainstorming what to do instead. That's when Sierra suggested we go to the cemetery. We live in a city at the end of the Oregon Trail, and what used to be the outskirts of the city was a little state park. The park is located on top of a large cliff. Also about a mile from the parking lot is a cemetery you can only go to by walking. The cemetery used to be an Indian graveyard, but over time, they would put people who lived in the city in the graveyard too. Also settlers used to chase off Indians off this cliff in droves, and many of the people of Indian descent have committed suicide by jumping off this cliff. Honestly, the whole place is just creepy and has this vibe, even during the day. Anyway, my fiance was really against it, but the group talked him into just going to the park. We get there around 1am and we are standing at the top of the cliff which overlooks the city. Everything is okay for a while, but then my fiancé quiets everyone down, and I swear to God we both heard footsteps to our left. Our whole group was to our right. We freaked out and made the whole group leave. As we were leaving, I looked at my fiancé and something to our left caught my eye. It was a bright ball. It came up from the top of the trees, made an arc and came back down. It wasn't like transparent like a flashlight, it was a solid, like if the moon were really off in the distance, but still really bright and white. I even thought it was the moon for a second, but then I looked up and saw the moon big and full and red from smoke from fires all over the state. Later in the car, I asked my fiance and our friend that we picked up earlier if they had seen it too. They had, so I wasn't going crazy for a second. There was actually something there. As we got to the car, my fiancé looked behind us and swears he saw another white orb in the forest. But it couldn't have been a lamp or something because we were at the edge of the city and there weren't houses for miles. Also, there were no other cars in the parking lot, so it couldn't have been another person. Anyway, we drove out there as fast as we could. We dropped off our friend and he had me drive his car because he was too freaked out. By the time I drove myself home, he seemed fine. Looking back, I really wish I had spent the night with him. The night after he dropped me off, everything was fine for a while. But once he started driving around the back roads near his house, weird things began to happen again. He listens to music on Pandora while driving. Well, mid-song, the track somehow skipped from Tiny Dancer to Dance with the Devil. Then, something black ran in front of him. He slammed on the brakes so not to hit it. He looked behind in the mirror to make sure there wasn't someone driving behind. That's when he saw a pair of eyes and dark outline of a person in his back seat. Then the song changed back to Tiny Dancer and the figure was gone. He parked the car in his driveway and ran inside on full panic. Nothing else happened that night, but he was a bag of nerves for days. Thanks for watching this video. Much appreciated guys. If you enjoyed these stories, 
be sure to hit that thumbs up button as it really does help me a lot. If you're new to the swamp, why not subscribe and hit those notification buttons to never miss a video. I upload videos almost every single day on all things creepy and anomalous. If you have a story that you'd like to share on a future video, if you have a story that you'd like to share on the channel, be sure to send it in to the email or the website that is in the description down below. On screen now you will see some cool things that you can click on, such as this missing 411 slash park ranger series called I Know Why People Are Going Missing in the Woods. It's almost two hours long and part three is coming soon, so you don't want to miss this thrilling, thrilling, creepy story.